Who were the biggest bugs in the fossil record and why don't we have big bugs living today? Welcome to another video on the fossil record. My name is Benjamin Berger and in this video I want to explore a period of time uh, when gigantic insects and other creepy crawlies roamed Earth's surface and explore some of the reasons that they vanished. Arthropoda is a major phylum of animals that is by far the most diverse today. There are over 30 different classes within this large and major clade or branch of the evolutionary tree of life on Earth. Teaching about the fossil record of Arthropoda is considerably challenging because so many living forms are known. And furthermore, the chitin exoskeleton of many of these animals does not preserve readily in the fossil record. So much of the study of these fossils centers around a few key fossil sites and localities. Making it even more challenging is that terrestrial arthropods, those living on land, have an even more limited fossil record. Uh, with the oldest record of terrestrial insects from the early Devonian uh, Rhyne Church of Scotland. So most of the big bugs that today we will examine occurred during the Pennsylvanian and early Permian periods of time. Uh, it was during this time, uh, around 300 million years ago that the great diversification of terrestrial uh, arthropods was underway and most of the largest terrestrial arthropods like insects and millipedes can be found during this period of time. So one misconception I want to point out is that not all arthropods uh, were enormous during this period of time. Uh, most fossils, uh, insects during recovered during the Pennsylvanian and uh, Permian show, you know, uh, normal and average sizes um, compared to like living scorpions and spiders and millipedes and flying insects and, and true insects uh, living today. So, however, there were, there were a few really big and exceptionally large bugs during this period of time which don't exist today. These monster bugs are so strange because they, they show us really how big arthropods can get and the possibilities of enormous sizes uh, that were living on land during this particular period in Earth's history. The largest and by far the craziest uh, big, <laughs> exceptionally big, is the millipede-like insect called Arthropleura armata. Now, various uh, estimates do exist out there uh, with widths up to uh, 55 centimeters and lengths, get this, of 263 centimeters. That's nearly nine feet long uh, that have been proposed. Now, recently there was an incredibly uh, well-preserved fossil specimen from Northumberland Basin in England, which was described from the late Mississippian Stanmore Formation, which preserved enough of the exoskeleton to support the 55 centimeter width of this millipede-like insect. Now, millipedes today belong to the class Diplopoda, uh, the largest living millipede, Archaeospirostructurus, reaches a length of only 33 centimeters and lives in Africa today. Most of these bugs are herbivores uh, or scavengers, uh, feeding on decaying uh, leaf and plant matter or fungus, um, some adapted to a carnivore diet to feed on other, other insects, but this requires specialized mouth parts. One of the reasons that millipedes got to these uh, large sizes is the presence of ooze pores. And they're found both in living and fossil specimens. These are openings for the secretion of poisons. 
Below each O's pore are glands that release irritants, uh, repellents, acids, nasty tasting chemicals, and even, in some groups, hydrogen cyanide gas. Uh, a highly poisonous uh, gas that was actually used in World War I during trench warfare and during the Holocaust. This anti-predator adaptation of poisonous glands uh, allows millipedes to avoid predation uh, by other insects and vertebrates, making them able to grow as big as they can without being eaten. The enormous size of Arthropleura is well documented because of a number of well-preserved trackways as well that have been found in North America and in Europe. These tracks show a parallel row of footprints from the numerous feet of these extinct giants, with about 28 or 30 walking appendages. These trackways, called Diplychnites, uh, Kuethes, is, that's the ecological uh, taxa name, give a really good range of the time in which these giants lived on Earth. Fossil trackways have been found from the late Mississippian around 325 million years ago up to the early Permian around 275 million years ago, indicating a long range of 50 million years. So this gigantic millipede was successful for a long time on Earth. These trackways are also found in a, in a wide variety of depositional environments, so they were not confined to the, to the wet tropical Carboniferous forests, but they also ventured out into the deserts. Here in Utah, their tracks have been found in the Permian Halagato Formation, which is below the Cedar Mesa Sandstone in southeastern Utah. Arthropleura also had to contend with the evolution of the large uh, tetrapod predators during the early Permian. Creatures like the gigantic amphibian Eriops um, and this synapsid, uh, Dimetrodon. So the development and use of poison glands likely became more important over time. Ultimately, Arthropleura went extinct at the end Permian mass extinction event, like so many other plants and animals of the time. The griffin flies are a group of extinct flying insects that appeared during the Mississippian period. They are um, distantly related to mayflies and dragonflies, although they are often described by the public as extinct dragonflies. The earliest flying insects appear in the fossil record around 320 million years ago, with the strange-looking insect Dilichichella, which had paired wings with an extra set of winglets uh, near the head. Now, these insects uh, developed the ability to fly, and the development of flight was likely to avoid the many ground and water predators of the time, with increasing numbers of fish and amphibians and early reptiles, and of course the abundance of the forests above. The canopy of trees became an excellent new habitat for these insects as a place to feed on the plants themselves and to avoid the predators below. This becomes the driving force of insect evolution of flight. Uh, these insects would develop as, uh, in the water as nymphs uh, using incomplete metamorphosis. That is, that the juvenile forms would resemble the adult forms, but they would lack the wings. So as the individual nymph grows um, and sheds its exoskeleton uh, through molting, they resemble more and more of the flying adult form until the final or next to final molt and they develop these wings and leave the water to find food and mates. This staged growth allowed these insects to get bigger with each growth stage. 
One of the largest of these early flying insects is Maison Theriarus from the famous Maison Creek uh, fossil beds in Illinois uh, from about 309 million years ago. It's a member of the Paleodiacteoptria. These insects are only known from fragments, but it's believed to have reached uh, maybe a wingspan of 56 centimeters, or nearly, nearly two feet. Um, the Maison Creek is also home to a, to a diversity of proarthroptria. -arth These are believed to be the, um, the early winged insects that would give rise to all the modern beetles. Throughout the Pennsylvanian period, one group of these early flying insects, called the griffin flies or Meganoptria, would become truly enormous. Uh, these were the carnivores and they hunted other flying insects with large, large eyes and gripping appendages to grab hold of prey. They were highly successful in the late Pennsylvanian period. It was a fantastic time to be a flying animal because pterosaurs and birds and, and bats had not yet evolved. They had the skies to themselves. Griffin flies got big. Mega Neuroopstia permiana uh, from the early Permian of Kansas is known from a wing impression. Discovered in 1934, the fossil is by far the largest winged insect known. The wing is about 33 centimeters long, indicating a wingspan of at least double that length, estimated around 75 centimeters, about the wingspan of a living bald eagle. So very impressive. Most griffin flies were not as big as Meganeuroopsis permiana. Um, there are a few additional large ones of note uh, that lived during the early Pennsylvanian period. Uh, the species Meganeurtis gracilips from Germany had a wingspan similar to Meganeuroopsis. Um, it was equally uh, enormous, giving giving us a fairly long uh, temporal range for these gigantic flying insects during the Pennsylvanian and, and actually well into the Permian uh, period in both, both North America and in Europe. Um, however, you know, the well-known Meganuria stilsius is, is kind of a more modest sized. Um, it's about, you know, three centimeter wingspan. So not all griffin flies were gigantic. Most of what we know about griffin flies comes from studying preserved wing impressions that are found in lacustrian shells. Uh, that is uh, fine-grained laminated rocks which are, were deposited in calm lake waters. Like many large bugs, the end Permian was a time of mass extinction, and griffin flies exited for the fossil record after this event. Griffin flies would, as an entire group, die out at the end Permian mass extinction, replaced by today's more modest sized mayflies and dragonflies. The next entry into our list is a scorpion. Scorpions have more isomeric growth compared to other bugs. What that means is that uh, the child forms look like the adult forms. And each stage of growth during molting, the animal just gets bigger rather than developing new appendages and a different appearance. So in animals that do this type of growth, the oldest and longest lived individual will be the biggest one. This is the case of Pomius scorpius curtitonius, an early fossil scorpion from the East Curtain Quarry in Scotland. While most of the scorpions recorded from this rock unit are more modest in size, large ones are around 30 centimeters, about one foot in length. This monstrous scorpion can get even bigger with exceptionally large specimens measuring up to 70 centimeters, or over two feet. 
Um, but these are only known from fragmentary parts. The East Curtain Quarry is interesting because it also contains many uh, early amphibians and tetrapods, which likely were feeding on these scorpions. And it's dated to around 335 million years ago during the last part of the Mississippian period, indicating that these were some of the first truly large, fully terrestrial scorpions. Palmyoscorpus belongs to an extinct early group of scorpions called the Mesoscorpiana. This group of scorpions would succumb to a major extinction at the end of the Permian period, with modern scorpions radiating after this in the early Triassic period, as they moved away from the wet marshland habitat, like that of the East Curtain Quarry, uh, into the dry deserts of the early Triassic, a habitat modern scorpions have become exceptionally well adapted for in the modern age. What allowed these late Paleozoic bugs to get so big. There have been many hypotheses for the large-bodied insects and other terrestrial invertebrates during this period of Earth's history. The oldest idea, which was first proposed in 1911, is that the atmosphere itself was enriched in oxygen. This extra oxygen made respiration much easier for the insects who were able to grow to these large sizes despite their strange and limited way of breathing air. Insects, including millipedes, have tiny networks of trachea, or little tubes distributed throughout their internal body cavity. Now, each segment has an opening through the exoskeleton into the outside environment. This is allowing oxygen and carbon dioxide to pass in and out of the body cavity, either passively or by pumping the exoskeleton and muscle fibers to inflate and deflate these tubes. This gas exchange is different than invertebrates, uh, which have red blood cells that pick up, move, and distribute the oxygen into individual cells, and they remove the carbon dioxide. The trachea in insects, however, serves both as the pulmonary and circulatory system. So one problem of this arrangement is that the trachea needs to be extensive enough to provide good gas exchange, and this limits the size insects can grow. But there's also even a bigger problem, and that is how arthropods grow with their exoskeletons having to be replaced by molting or shedding them at key points in their life history. During each growth stage, the animal must not only shed its exoskeleton, but also the network of trachea distributed throughout the body cavity. So this process uh, precedes the shedding of the exoskeleton. It pulls out all of the trachea, so the animal has to grow new ones internally. This leaves the animal without a functioning respiratory system, having to solely rely on the passive exchange of gases from the externally exposed outer cells. The bigger the animal, the more challenging it is to get oxygen into those internal cells during this period of their life, as they no longer have a functioning trachea to provide those internal connections. If you're small enough, gas exchange can occur during this period of time in the molting animal. But if the animal is larger, it's literally having to hold its breath during the molting stage of its life. If the outside environment was enriched in oxygen, then it would be less of an issue and bigger body sizes could be supported during these last molting stages. Now, this idea has gained a lot of scientific interest, and there is a widespread acceptance that the late Paleozoic air uh, was a period of rather abundant oxygen, much greater than the 21% that we have today. One of the interesting studies that I found while researching for this uh, video was a paper by Matthew Chapland and Jared Carr, who used hundreds of measurements of fossil insect wings to see what statistical patterns existed through geological time. 
During the Paleozoic era, large wings are found which exceed modern sizes. However, the mathematical mode of sizes has not changed as much, with most fossil wings from the late Paleozoic era being similar to modern sizes of insect wings. It appears that there was not an evolutionary trend towards smaller sizes through time, but that during the late Paleozoic era, there was much more variation in body size. Flying insects could and did grow to larger sizes than modern flying insects. There is a distinct point at the end Permian extinction that this limit in body size becomes an issue. Um, across the Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras, flying insects never got as big as they did during the late Paleozoic. One additional explanation is the mass extinction was particularly bad for these larger forms. And then something occurred during the Mesozoic air that really kind of prevented flying insects from re-evolving into these larger sizes. One explanation is the origin of flying vertebrates, particularly pterosaurs during the mid to late Triassic period and the birds during the late Jurassic period. Um, these fed on flying insects, preventing larger sizes to reappear. Furthermore, animals like dinosaurs and large archosaurs in the Triassic period, they would easily feed on these big bugs. Not only was the atmosphere different, but there was also many more predators looking to feed on these big bugs. Even with nasty poisons, the age of the big bugs was over. One of the interesting aspects of terrestrial arthropod evolution is that it violates Cope's rule. Cope's rule is that over time, lineages will tend toward larger and larger body sizes. That is, that the biggest species are the more recent ones. Um, this rule is you know, it's often broken in many groups, with smaller forms often replacing larger forms, and, and maybe an actual artifact of increasing variability and diversity, as well as completeness of the fossil record with time. Uh, rather than necessarily an intrinsic biological law or rule. So in the case of terrestrial arthropods, they tend to violate this rule, um, as many of the largest forms are actually found early in their evolutionary history. Thank you so much for sticking around and watching this video. I really appreciate it. This is a really fun video to make. It almost didn't happen, but I really want to thank my Patreons for supporting me uh, uh, in, in producing some of these interesting videos about the fossil record and sort of go back and look at some things that I have not done a video about before. So it was very nice to stay uh, indoors on a chilly January uh, day and film this wonderful video for you guys. Uh, thank you so much and I hope you appreciate it.